Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Asia Rugby Live, Real Talk, Real Rugby. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our Facebook and YouTube page and press on the bell button to receive future notification of new content from us. For the latest news on rugby, log on to asiarugby.com. Of course, there's plenty of news to update you guys uh, on asiarugby.com. Number one, Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games Rugby 7 schedule has been confirmed. So that's great news. That, that's a, that was supposed to happen uh if i'm not mistaken end of this month or was it last part okay either one but uh that the, the schedule has been confirmed so that's going to be in july 2021 so of course i am looking forward a lot of people are looking forward and i am sure that all of you are looking forward to that as well and of course because of that the olympic games the uh for for the china sevens team for the women's team that has given them time to prepare for uh, for the Tokyo Olympics. So that's in the news on Asia Rugby Live as well. And Maya Skauri, the next news is Maya Skauri yielding the way for female rugby coaches in Jordan. So, of course, news like this will definitely make one of our guests to be very, very happy. I'll introduce you guys uh, to, to, to her later. Okay, so now, um, and also I would like to, you know, update you guys on not forgetting that the world is opening up and rugby is has also it uh, is in restarting mode australia joined new zealand and russia uh, as they have started super rugby australia which is awesome news for rugby and it is only a matter of time when the whole world resumes back to full rugby contact and to those who have been following Asia Rugby Live, uh, this is the last episode for the season, the season finale. And for the season finale, we have two very special guests today. And the first one is from World Rugby and she's the general manager of Women's Rugby, Katie Settler. Katie, how have you been? I'm good. Very good. Uh, so, so how's things in Dublin for you right now? Like, uh, uh, has things gone back to normal for you? Oh, not quite. Um, it's a beautiful day in Dublin, which is which is unusual. We're in the middle of the summer, but no, we're still World Rugby is still working um, remotely from home, um, which is good. It's it's given us lots of time to actually do some really good planning and, and thinking. Um, but we're certainly not in our offices, and it'll be it'll be a couple of months yet. I uh, think it's for you guys. You deal with people from all over the world, so I am sure uh, that that is not a problem for you working from home. And of course, we have our Mr. President from Asia uh, Rugby. He has been on the first episode and right now he came back for the season finale to give uh, some updates on Asia Rugby. Kais Al, uh, Abdullah Adala. Kais, how have you been? And, and you know, uh, UAE has been open uh, its borders to, to, to foreigners. So that's great news, huh? Yeah, 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 exactly. Actually, we are back to the normal, uh, to the new normal life. And um, sport and everywhere in the UAE is uh, restarting uh, uh, since two weeks now. So things are opening up. And as you said, it's just a matter of time when we all can see a contact rugby back on field. So, so far, what do you think of Asia Rugby Live and how uh, things have changed for rugby in Asia for the past three months? Sorry, is that for me to answer? Yes. Oh, no, well, it's, I, it's, it's okay. I, okay. Yeah. I, this, the show. Okay. Has yeah, been... but I think I think Kais has been uh, disconnected. Yeah, Katie. Probably you. You have been. We have been watching a lot of our episodes. I'm sure, right? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. what do you reckon of Asia Rugby Live and how things oh, have changed I, I, for I, rugby it's in Asia? Been, it's, been, it's been fantastic. I mean, I talk about it all the time to the other regions. Uh, I think the profiling that you've been doing on, you know, obviously I'm a bit partial to all the, the amazing captains that you've been profiling, but the story's right across the board. I mean, you know, it really is a step up in terms of getting messages across, getting people active, keeping people connected to, to rugby. Um, and I, I think that, you know, do credit to all of you that are putting the show together and for Case and the board for actually making sure that these kind of communications happen across Asia. And uh, Kais, I think Kais is back. Kais, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, okay. Cool. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, what do you reckon on, you know, for the past three months, Asia Rugby Life, we have been doing this for the past three months. And uh, what do you think on, on the, how things have changed for rugby in Asia for the past three months? 
actually, if you talk about numbers, we had 10 episodes for the last uh, few months. We had 38 guests across the all five regions, and uh, we have over 1 million uh, reach. We have around uh, three, 234 videos, uh, views. So, I mean, uh, from all aspects, uh, those kind of communication, virtual communication is very important to us, especially at those uh, moments, because it, it keep you near your member unions to understand them more, to engage with them more. So, you know, that's the way forward. As much as you are nearby your member unions, as much as you will make more successes. Th that's for me is like a principle. And I think the key word here is connectivity, right, guys? I'm sure you will agree with me. Connectivity is really important uh, in, in this area. Exactly. No doubt. Connectivity with the biggest region, the biggest population. I mean, we are growing now from 31 member unions to 34 after admitting Iraq, Palestine and uh, Cambodia. So, I mean, as you said, connectivity, it's, it's really crucial for us in Asia Rugby and and that's why we have done this kind of live show uh, to be more engaging with our uh, audience and and that's the way forward even after the pandemic is over we will keep doing this because we have noticed the success behind all those of live shows people are interested they can talk they can express their views openly and and that's what we want we don't want closed doors we want people to talk up and to speak up openly and so we understand them more if we understand them more we can give them more we offer them more so you know as you said connectivity is the and transparency definitely uh, so you know saying that i think i would like to invite our audience to ask any questions should you like uh, on facebook or on youtube uh i'm i'm sure mr kais and katie would uh, be happy to answer any of your questions uh, should you have uh, any and uh, moving on i think i want to touch a bit on uh women's rugby in asia to katie of course uh katie how how is this important to the world rugby agenda well it's incredibly important and you know you can you can but sort of smile when you sort of see the successes like some of you may or may not know I, i've been at world rugby now for just over three years and i ironically um rugby asia was my case study i had to do as part of my interview i was kind of asked how would i grow the game in asia with the fact that the rugby world cup and the olympic games were there and so i did quite a bit of research to find out what was going on and and it was one of the reasons that i got really excited about the role because i saw the huge potential I mean, Asia has been doing such amazing trailblazing things for quite a long period of time. Um, you know, this series, this is really, this is really unique in terms of um, some of the things that are happening compared to other regions. Um, I visited, it was the first place I went to in terms of a general assembly. I, I went to Mongolia when I was trying to develop the global strategy and listen to people's thoughts about what needed to happen to grow the game. You know, it was the first, it was um, Ada Milby was the first woman on World Rugby. Um, some of the trailblazers that you have in terms of coaching, you know, I, I often talk about um, the success. I, we launched uh, the, the accelerating the development of women's rugby plan in Dubai at the sevens at the under 17 um, women's Asian tournament. And that was just amazing to see the number of women that were involved in coaching positions. Um, a real kind of sort of step up uh, in terms of, you know, having head coaches in Hong Kong and Japan, where we're really sort of struggling to get women into some of those leadership positions in other places around the world. Uh, you know, excellent examples of um, good training opportunities that you run for women in terms of leadership forums, the one that's coming up in Hong Kong this year that I'm hoping to get involved with. But all up, you know, we have four unstoppables from Asia in our Try and Stop Us campaign, and they are amazing. Uh, and the energy that has been shown by the board of Rugby Asia and their new Women's Advisory Committee to keep driving the necessary things that need to happen to grow the game in Asia um, is, is, is fantastic. 
Oh, you know, I just love your enthusiasm when you were talking about women's rugby in Asia. You you just light up, and I'm sure Kais will be happy from from your feedback just now. Kais, uh, probably you can share with us, you know, the importance of uh growing uh women's rugby in Asia. You must be happy from what Katie said just now, huh? Yeah, exactly. Um, I do remember the first time she joined us. It was in Ulaanbaatar in the uh, capital city of Mongolia. And uh, she was a bit, uh, you know, uh, feeling strange to be amongst Asians. And I do remember those moments well, but she, well done to Katie, she adapted very quick and she established a very good relationship with our uh, Women's Advisory Committee, chaired by Ada Milby, a uh, World Rugby Council member. So just to give a little uh, taste to how do we look, how do we preserve the Women's Advisory Committee? In Asia Rugby, Women's Advisory Committee is the biggest committee amongst all the other committees. It has uh, 13 members uh, uh, from across all the region, uh, South, uh, Central, uh, East, South, and East. Uh, and moreover than that, uh, only recently, a few days ago, we have awarded uh, all interested members of the Women's Advisory Committee an observatory uh, role into the Others Committee. So we are not only giving them the chance to be at the Women's Advisory Committee, we are always enhancing them and developing them by giving them an observatory status in the other committees. Like for instance, uh, uh, an A member can reach the Admin and Finance Committee, uh, B member can go to the audit and risk. C member can go to the competition committee and so on. Uh, so this also excel their abilities. And as Katie said, uh, it, it, it is a big challenge across the other regions uh, to find a real female who can uh, have a leadership role. So we in Asia, uh, apart from having the Women Advisory Committee, we are also exposing them as much as possible into the other core business of Asia Rugby. So in, in the near future, they can be leaders in their respective unions and one day maybe being president or exco member of Asia Rugby, why not? And for sure, I think we have uh, some like uh, the, the the recipients of the uh, recent scholarship by World Rugby. I think we have some really good uh, leaders there who have been you know involved with their own union and of sure. course the uh, the scholarship that has been received by them uh Katie what are your you know vision for women's rugby as a whole well it's pretty big um but it's definitely achievable and we are on track i mean globally world rugby have made a, a commitment that this is the strategic growth area for the game it is an area that we're seeing a huge increase in numbers year on year and and we want to make sure that every union around the world capitalizes on that growth um, because it, it just adds to the whole character of rugby but it, it is about accelerating the global development of, of women in rugby and and i guess ultimately I, what that looks like is that you know we we signed off on an eight-year plan we're into year three of it and we want to be in a situation that when you think about rugby wherever it's played around the world it's a sport that is played by girls and boys men and women it's not a sport that's played by men and men and oh yes women sometimes play it too so we're really trying to drive that integration in terms of both genders uh uh, feeding off each other, making a great kind of a sport for all. Um, we've got a very simple plan, which kind of hits some high level objectives of what we're trying to achieve over this period. The first is about participation, doubling the number of participation. And, and, and Asia is just uh, rocking those kind of numbers. And I, I, we might talk a little bit about that later in terms of the increases in, in participation numbers across the board in Asia. We're looking at having um, linked up inspirational, aspirational competitions for both sevens and fifteens so that they're driving the growth as well. Um, diversity in terms of leadership, listening to case, I mean, that's absolutely fantastic initiative. We want to make sure that the, the decision making structures that guide the future development of the game is reflective of the people who play it and diversity makes sense. And so sometimes you have to have a bit of a nudge to make sure that we get more women involved, but that ultimately is, is where we're trying to go. Profile. Well, you know, we're going to talk about hopefully the Unstoppable campaign. We're really trying to make sure 
that people inside rugby obviously know that women play, but outside and across the across the globe, because that helps lift the profile in terms of commercial investment, and also in terms of just getting people talking about some of the barriers um, that exist to playing rugby, and seeing how countries around the world have embraced those barriers and individuals and are just absolutely involved. And then lastly, I guess one of my big things that I uh, that I really want to work on and, and working very closely with the commercial team at World Rugby is to create a proper commercial base to underpin the activity. You know, up until now, uh, women's rugby has definitely been supported financially and it will be for quite some time from the men's commercial program. But we've made a big call in the last 12 months to unbundle the commercial rights and to seek specific women's rugby sponsors and we want to work with regions and unions as well to actually embrace new commercial partnerships that are interested in in things that might be just a little bit different than the men's commercial partners but you know if you tie all those five work streams together you're certainly going to see uh, a, a strong robust sport that is represented by both genders um, really up there with most of the other um, the codes around the world I'm sure we at Asia Rugby, we share the same uh, vision with what you want to achieve, Katie. And I'm sure uh, Mr. Kais will uh, definitely agree with me on that. Uh, it, uh, Mr. Kais, probably you can share with us in terms of the commercialization on what Katie said just now. Uh, do you reckon is uh, it's achievable in Asia? Yes, it is achievable in Asia. Um... We were thinking about commercializing some core of, of, of the female activities because obviously, uh, you know, with the growing base and growing population of female in a sport across Asia, uh, I'm, I'm not talking in particular to any, any zone in Asia out of the five zone, but let's take uh, West Asia as an example. You know, West Asia is a conservative uh, zone, uh, Muslims and, you know, from GCC countries plus Jordan, Lebanon, and Palestine. But if, if you look at the sport overall, not only rugby, football, basketball, all the other sport, it's really growing uh, as a population, as a female population in West Asia. Definitely, some corporates will be, will be interested to tap in, into this market, especially the, the female market. Um, and then we were just uh, challenged with the pandemic uh, since March, but uh, it's very soon when the pandemic will be over and we will reactivate uh, how can we better commercialize some of the female activities in Asia? Because definitely uh, I am 100% sure our corporates, companies across the region, across the whole continent that will be interested in the female participation, not necessarily men's. And this is what we are trying to do and what we will be doing in the future. So saying that, do you think that women's rugby is growing faster than men's in Asia? What do you think of that, guys? Okay, let's talk. I always, I always uh, talk based on numbers, on facts, uh, not hypothesis and then through unrealistic words. Yes. If you look at the numbers, uh, uh, historically from the last three years, from get into rugby data get into rugby is the development tool adapted by world rugby and all the region are are performing get into rugby we have around 40 percent female population out of the whole population when we talk about get into rugby we have around 300,000 female participation every year in the last three years now we have we have the biggest committee in Asia rugby is the women's advisory committee and and we have the the growing number of competition 18s 20 uh, under 20s 7s 15s it's also growing year by year so all of this gives you a holistic picture that we do care about the female participation because this is an integral part of any organization, either a regional organization or a global organization. And don't forget, only two days ago, uh, uh, Thomas Bach, the president of the International Olympic Committee, announced that at the moment, the executive board of the IOC has more than 33% female participation. We in Asia Rugby, uh, I'm just announcing that for the first time, we are now placing uh, an article proposed changes to the council 
because they are alt, alt, this is the ultimate body for approving any any alteration to the articles to add uh, the second female executive member into executive committee at the moment you know asia rugby has 12 executive committee one of them at least must be female who is ada melby at the moment we are now placing an amendment to the articles to the council to be adapted soon to add the executive member number 13 and then out of the 13 there there must be two female members out of the 13 that already represent 15 percent of the future executive committee of Asia Rugby. So we are stepping forward on the governance angle or in the development angle or even in the competition. So, so we know well what we are doing and we know where we are heading. It's just a matter of time. And, uh, and one day you might have a, a really equal participation male to female, and that's what we want. Mr. Kais, I just love it when you, you know, uh, speak on the basis of numbers so yeah that's you uh, from an accounts uh, background i think that's why you have all these numbers uh, to back you up yeah uh, and and also i think okay probably we can see there's a uh, question from facebook probably we can see it right now okay i would like to know what are the strength um okay wait one second what are the strengths and weaknesses of Asian rugby. Okay, probably Katie, you can uh, you can answer this. Is uh, is the strengths and weaknesses from a woman's perspective? I'm assuming you know I'm not. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. I think this is well, Nahid. I mean, Nahid is one of the unstoppables. Oh, hello, Nahid. Nice to have you yeah. with us this morning. Um, I, I think oh, I think there's far more strengths than weaknesses, but I, I mean I've, I've talked about some of them. I, I, I you know. Rugby Asia have been trailblazers in terms of driving changes um, that we want to see right across the globe. Um, their commitment to developing coaches, women coaches. I mean, we came out with a, globally, we came out with a, a toolkit just recently, which talked about how to get more women involved in um, diversity and coaching teams. And there is full of pictures of uh, women coaches from Asia um, that are profiled in that booklet. So, so the fact that you know, when I did an analysis of um, how many women were involved in coaching at a world level in 2017, Hong Kong was the only um, team at that time that had a woman in a head coach position. You've now got Japan. So, you know, real strong leadership in, in driving women involved in coaching. But just listening to the, the, the comments that Case said, I remember um, meeting with you, Case, I don't know if you remember this, but in Dubai, when we launched the plan and you talked about your passion for um, what should happen in terms of uh, women's rugby. So it's great to sort of see you making those things happen. Um, weaknesses, I, 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 you know, I don't think there's any um, significant weaknesses. I mean, clearly it's a large, large region. So um, I would say that the challenge is more than weaknesses. I mean, getting everyone on, on board in terms of competitions when you have so far to travel, um, having so many diverse cultures, which can be a challenge, but it is also, um, it, 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 it adds to the richness of the competitions. You know, I, I, I love coming to Asia and, and seeing the multi-cultures um, playing on the field, all shapes and sizes, and, it, and you certainly see that in Asia. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that there's, there's significant weaknesses. There's challenges and there's opportunities, um, but most of the things that I've seen in Asia um, since my work have been about the strengths. I love your enthusiasm again. I love the enthusiasm for sure. <laughs> uh, and I think we have another uh, question on Facebook. This time is for Kais. Let us see the question. Okay, so what are the uh, what are Asia rugby plans for the South Asia region and the status of inclusion of rugby in the SAF games? Kais, can you comment on that? okay um i think the c the saf mean the south asian federation games this is a multi-sport event taking place every four years similar to the asian games but on a lower scale you know the the asian games is the top uh, multi-sport event in asia uh, maybe rank number four worldwide in terms of commercial revenue and uh, spectators so the, the South Asian Federation uh, Games was held, I think, last year. 
and uh, the next one will be in 2022 in Pakistan. Uh, at the moment, we have uh, from the we have from the South Region India. I mean, when I say have the federation, the, the existing national governing federation, India, Sri Lanka, uh, Nepal, uh, uh, India, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and um, we have a couple of, we, I think we have five countries in the south. Uh, so for, for us as Asia Rugby to have a rugby inclusion into the South Asian Federation Games in 2022, uh, at least four uh, four national Olympic committees have to write to the South Asian Federation Games and ask for rugby inclusion. But from our side, as a, as a regional body, we will be working closely with the uh, Olympic Council of Asia and with the South Asian Federation uh, to, uh, to stress the importance of having rugby in 2022 because it, uh, it was not there in the last edition. Uh, last year so we will we will ensure that in 2022 in pakistan the south asian games will have uh, will be featuring rugby because rugby is an olympic sport and rugby sevens and uh, it, it, uh, i'm 100 percent sure that it will be included uh, with the intensive effort that we'll be having in the next few few months yeah, I think it's just a matter of time when uh, South uh, Asia Federation Games have, you know, uh, will include rugby in their games for sure. Uh, moving forward, I want to ask you the next question. What are the plans for Asia Rugby for the rest of 2020 and probably you can touch on 2021 as well? Okay, that's, uh, that's the $1 million question. Everyone yeah, asking sure. this question. <laughs> And yeah. uh, there are no blames here. Uh, everyone wants to play rugby and contact rugby. I understand this, but we always need to to think and we always need to be very logical about player welfare. Uh, we work very closely with World Rugby, um, especially with Mark Egan, head of uh, performance and competitions. And as you know, as everybody knows, Asia Rugby already announced the cancellation of Q1 and uh, Q2, Q3. Uh, we, we are only now uh, having Q4 as an open window for a tournament to be held. Uh, we are monitoring the global health uh, situation. We are monitoring also with various countries the travel restrictions. And uh, let me tell you, it's not easy. Uh, it is much easier to have local rugby in each country domestically but to have a, an intra-regional competition that's something still challenging at the moment not only for rugby for football for basketball for all other sport you know the olympic council of asia just postponed the asian beach games which was scheduled to be in sanya in china in november it was uh, postponed to 2021 for a further notice so uh, this gives you an indication that we are still monitoring the situation. There is no guarantee, guarantees that in Q4 there will be competition. There might not be any competition. And if, if there will not be any competition, definitely 2021 will be uh, packed with events. So our competition committee chaired by my colleague Alsanga Seneviratni from Sri Lanka with the management team of Asia Rugby headed by Johnny, uh, our CEO, is working hard to, to have a proper calendar, uh, which will be easier for, for unions to be adapted. And don't forget, when the pandemic is over, uh, the ticket price might be a bit uh, increasing than before. So we need to also bear in mind the tickets cost, the hotels cost. So there are many aspects we are studying at the moment. Uh, it's not an easy job. It is a, it is a very complicated uh, matter, but we are on, on top of it. Yeah, for sure. I think um, it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's very, very complicated. There's a lot of areas that you need to touch on. Uh, I think moving forward, probably can we can touch uh, on the surface beyond 2021 are there any uh, long term plans that uh, you know you guys have spoke about yeah of course uh, don't forget that uh, 
a couple of Asian rugby tournament are already linked to global tournament like the World Rugby Junior Championship. Uh, it link also to Rugby World Cup 2023 in France. So there are a couple of tournaments in Asia that have a pathway to a bigger events. Uh, all of those, uh, some of them are in this year, but due, due to the pandemic, we are shifting those tournaments to 2020. Uh, before we think about 2021, we need to be realistic and logical to sort out the calendar for 2020. Uh, for tw I mean for 2021, before we think about 2022, because 2021, uh, uh, if all tournament in 2020 were cancelled, some of them will have, I presume, a double header in 2021, uh, like Division One, uh, because Division One will has a pathway. The 115 aside men's, it has a pathway to the Rugby World Cup, because you know, if Division One has taken a place this year. The winner of Division One will play uh, the bottom of top three, but this have not taken place. It means that next year we need to bear in mind and to be very fair to unions in Division One and top three, because uh, if next year we will have one Division One and one tournament top three, as I said, the winner of Division One will play the 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 bottom of top three, but that's only a one tournament. And instead of having two tournaments this year and next year. So, you know, we need to be careful and also designing the calendar for next year and to avoid the previous problems uh, where the 15th and 7th uh, calendars were mixed up. Uh, when I say mixed up, not mixed up on the Asian level, mixed up on the, on the national governing bodies level, and the union's level, because, for example, Sri Lanka has different season for 15s. Singapore has different season for 15s. Uh, United Arab Emirates has a different season for 15s and for 7s. So the competition committee has a mandate to ensure that as much as possible, we have a full alignment between the domestic leagues and the Asian calendar. So it is a complicated, and I don't want to comment on 2022. Uh, we are just concentrating on 2021 now. Wow, you have a tough job there, man. <laughs> There's a lot of things that you need to think about for the future. Uh, right. Okay, I right. think I think I want to just, yeah, I just want to take a step back and uh, probably talk about uh, women's rugby a little bit for KT, the unstoppable campaign. Uh, you know, how did it uh, accelerate growth for women's uh, rugby, you reckon? Oh, it was um, it was and is because it's not finished yet uh, a, a huge big leap in terms of um, women's rugby. I mean, I, I, a shout out to the four unstoppables from Asia for to Nahi, Phoenix, Sreta and Anna um, who have helped work with me to drive that campaign. It was really lovely meeting them all in London and getting them to all meet each other. They've actually become a really good team of people around the world that are that are unstoppable. But yeah, the, the campaign set some pretty big lofty objectives in terms of driving participation growth, um, lifting the profile and getting people engaged in, in women's rugby, having some, you know, getting people talking about uh, the challenges and the opportunities associated with it, changing perceptions about women's rugby. And then also, like I said earlier about driving, um, you know, getting us noticed, so starting to drive a commercial program to underpin it. When you just look at the results purely, I just the cases, Case being the numbers person, I'll just kind of look at what's happened in, in Rugby Asia in terms of women's numbers. It, it, it has been huge. You know, we, you've sort of seen um, uh, overall over the last four years, I think it's about 147% increase in growth in women's rugby participants in Asia. Um, but particularly looking at those, those four unions that were involved in the campaign, India, who's you know, um, once again, congratulations. There was a great article of Rugby India in the latest um, Rugby World magazine. So if you haven't read that, go and, and take it out and have a look at it. But, but you know, 108% growth. Malaysia that went from 753 years ago to 9,000 women playing rugby. And Iran, you know, and I do use them quite a bit with Nahid and, and the great stuff that Dr. Hassan is doing there. You know, just looking at 218 to 219 figures, so pre and post campaign, went from 3,100 
um, uh, players to over 10,000 and being played in, in most of the provinces in Iran. So it is working, but we're just about to, you know, there'll be something coming out from World Rugby next week that um, will land on Casey's desk. And I know that a lot of people inside uh, Asia Rugby have been doing some work behind the scenes. We're about to roll out phase two of the um, Unstoppable campaign, and we're really looking forward to seeing what uh, amazing women, and particularly in Asia, to keep that momentum going. Uh, for Malaysia, I just want to take a little bit of credit because uh, women's rugby <laughs> in Malaysia started in my club, Royal Slango Club. So. <laughs> right. You're doing very well, then. No, it's excellent, exceptional stuff, and it's you know it's it's only good news about what's happening in terms of growing women's rugby everywhere. Yes, yeah, for sure. And uh, talking about growing the game, and uh, I think, guys, uh, you, you can share with us, there are some new members of Asia Rugby, and that's great news for Asia Rugby, right? And, of course, you guys are looking at um, uh, including more members for Asia Rugby in the future? Yeah, yeah, that's one of the one of the objectives of Asia Rugby, is to have more members uh, joining the family. Uh, don't forget, uh, if again you talk about the numbers, uh, the Asian Football Confederation has 45 members. We used to have 31, and only a one week ago we have increased to 34. So we are almost 11 members away from the Asian Football Confederation. We are working uh, towards having more unions, uh, Kuwait, Oman, uh, Bahrain, Maldives from Central, uh, uh, Vietnam, and uh, a couple of others as well. Uh, we, we, are, we have a long way to go, but don't forget that having new federation in those countries will require a lot of efforts a lot of connectivity, communication. You need to go there and meet the National Olympic Committee, meet the Minister of Sport, try to encourage them. Because at the end of the day, in every country, having a new federation means an extra financial burden on them. So we need to be pragmatic also in approaching those countries. But we, I bear in mind this is very well. And uh, we all do care about having more members in the coming year, I mean, in 2021. Uh, in terms, pro probably since you you mentioned about financial burden just now, like for new uh, Asia Rugby members, do they get like any form of financial backing from Asia Rugby? Yes. Uh, um, uh, as you know, Asia Rugby uh, depends heavily on World Rugby uh, Development Grants and competition grants that they have been given every year. Uh, apart from this, we have our own uh, little resources from the from a couple of sponsors, and we are using that uh, extra resources and from our reserves to assist the non-world rugby members. You know, we have 34 now. Uh, around 19 to 20 are already world rugby members. Uh, some of them are majority are full full members. I mean, full members rugby got directly the development grants from World Rugby, but associate World Rugby members and Asia Rugby members do not get anything from World Rugby. So what we are trying to do is to utilize uh, ten percent of our reserves on an annual basis, in addition to little uh, sponsorship that we do have, and we are looking forward to more sponsorship at the moment to help uh, those new members uh, with, with development grants. Uh, we are also helping them, apart from the financial assistance, we are helping them also with the technical side by providing them with courses, sending them uh, trainers and master trainers to their respective countries to have, tour, to have uh, courses. So uh, assist them in the admin side. Uh, we had also uh, we had we have uh, adopted an idea of uh, of funding an admin person in every union. You know, uh, having an admin in every union is very important because if you don't have an admin personnel at least one, even part time in every union, how are you gonna do your day to day work? 
you you can't have your your competition and development activities without having an admin personnel so we are encouraging also and supporting the administrative uh, perspective of each union and uh, assisting them also financially uh, with those uh, payouts so we are we are bearing in mind those challenges at the moment and we, we are tackling them uh, okay it's probably with the help of kt in the future we can get more grants from world rugby <laughs> anyway <laughs> uh kt uh there's a question for you from facebook can we see the question one second okay so for kt what are what are be plans of to support women's rugby 15s of the 30 plus uh asia rugby member unions only seven to eight play women's rugby 15s internationally yeah i think that um you know i think that's a joint a joint top support uh question for asia rugby and and globally for world rugby uh, I, I, you know, when I arrived in, in the role, uh, it was just post the Olympics and the, the real big buzz was out there about what a fantastic effort that went on in Rio and the huge growth of the game globally in sevens. And I remember sort of sitting down with, um, Sir Bill Beaumont and in, in Argentina and he was, he, I was sort of kind of just trying to get a feel for what were we trying to achieve? I'd only just started in the role. Um, you know, was it about sevens or was it about fifteens? And he made it really clear that the 15s was the DNA of, of the traditional game and that we needed to do all that we could do to make sure that the sevens was fantastic and it was great being in the Olympics and it's a, it's a great kind of introduction to the game, but the 15s was really, really important. And so we've been working um, kind of behind the scenes over the last 18 months on how do we you know, populate the 15s calendar um more in terms of making sure that it that they both are very strong uh global competitions and a key to that is regional growth you know so this just like Kay said there's no point in us putting on um re, uh, global competitions if we don't have strong regional and strong domestic development programs and and um, competition programs so we are very keen to assist unions you know but in saying that it, you know, I think that the, the bonus of our sport is that we do have so many formats of the game. I mean, when I went to Mongolia, I was exposed to the snow rugby and I know that there's beach rugby. I haven't sort of seen that playing yet on video, but on video. So we do have multiple different ways of people to engage from both a participation and a competition perspective. But we do um, want to make sure that we work with the regional associations and target unions to help them with their development plans to grow the 15s game, because it is, that is the game for all shapes and sizes, and it does allow um, many more people to be exposed to what is such an amazing game. Oh, that's great. Uh, you know, stuff that you guys have been doing for, for uh, to grow women's uh, rugby uh, around the world, especially in Asia. And of course, I think you know that there's a lot of potential for Asia as how we have what the biggest population in the world. And I'm sure Kais will definitely agree with that. I think uh, the, the last question here is for Kais. Um, moving forward uh, for, for Asia rugby, what are our strengths? Um, okay, let's see. What would be your key message uh, for unions to keep their players busy? Thanks for this season. Yeah. Okay. What would you, what would uh, you, uh, what would be your key message for unions to keep their players busy? Um, uh, it's obviously uh, my key message to every union is to reinvent rugby domestically and uh, to have their own competition domestically because we i mean on the asian level uh, we are still not sure if we're gonna have anything in q4 but the only way to keep them busy and uh, and active is to have uh, to reactivate rugby in their in every country so each union has to have uh, uh, a clear and uh, a constant communication with the olympic committee and with the ministry of sport with the local authority to get rugby back on field as as soon as possible uh, obviously players are are so eager to go back so unions must open the doors unions must open their doors by by inviting them to tournament that's the way to keep them busy
And of course, I think, uh, uh, like in Malaysia, I, I'll take Malaysia into context. What what the government has announced is uh, competitions are allowed, but the carnival like competitions like sevens and tens are not allowed anymore yet pro for this year but 15s are we are able to play 15 soon i think starting from the 15th of august so i think uh, that's one of the great uh, news for malaysia rugby and i hope uh, a lot of the unions in the world or especially in asia can follow that footsteps and i would like to apologize to everyone to all of our viewers that actually guys kais and katie there's tons of questions for you guys but we aren't able to answer each and every one of them like really really like our, my producer has been on me hey, hey let's go to the next video let's go to the next question but you know guys sorry that we have run out of time we'll keep your questions guys who has been asking we'll keep your questions for the next season we'll definitely we will definitely be back mr kais is very happy with with uh, the show and of course, with the transparency that uh, Mr. Kais has been upholding, we will be back with uh, to answer all of your questions in the next season. Thank you very much to our loyal viewers who has been joining us week in, week out. You know, to to discover about new things, to to you know, to share your questions to to us. Uh, we'll be back for season two of Asia Rugby Live. Thank you very much, Kais. Thank you very much, Katie, for being with us. And I'm sure you, both of you, will be back on the show. <laughs> Kais, you can never run away. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. No, no. It's our pleasure <laughs> to be there and to communicate with the audience. And that's the way, as a leader, you need to be in the forefront. You cannot just hide behind the doors. You need to face questions. You need to answer them openly. You don't need to hide anything because we are not doing anything wrong. We are doing everything for the betterment of HO Rugby. That's it. Very simple. I love that. I love that. Okay, guys. Thank you very much for joining us. Guys, yeah. Katie, again, thank you. Yeah. Viewers, thank you very much. See you again in the next season. This is HO Rugby Live. Real talk, real rugby. I brought. See you again. Bye-bye. Hello and salam to everyone. Welcome to Asia Rugby Live. Real talk, real rugby. Uh, thank you, Asadek. Can I speak in uh, Russian? They see that we learn a lot from the sport off the field as well. There's a lot of things that we can take into uh, a lot of life skills that we can apply in everyday life. Uh, we've got lots of prima donnas, we've got lots of uh, superstars who aren't really superstars. The intimidated playing the likes of Michael Leach, you know, on your opposite. Uh, or I'm you know, it. It. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was fantastic achievement uh, that uh, they were be including in, in, to, to, to Olympic Games. And the values that they learned through rugby, um, this made the parents want, want their kids to be more involved in rugby. They, they inspire to be uh, their, their local heroes. Too. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm tired and everything. Come on, yeah. give me a ball. <laughs> give me some <laughs> you got to get so technical, like you've got to be perfect at scrumming, you've got to be perfect at line outs. Because I want to show them that Thai women rugby can be professional. So if I sit at home, I was getting angry and not feeling well. I went to the rugby training, so it was amazing. You've actually picked on my passion really. Rugby World Cup in Japan was really something uh, out of the world. Well, the coach has been saying it's, it's about Having direction. Uh, I have one ticket on the on the bus. Huh? It is, it is normal for us. Bus. Normal with us. Imperial star, Doctor Rod. Alright, guys, don't forget to join us. Same time, same day. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Okay, till then, this is Asia Rugby Live. Real talk, real rugby.